Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Tom Hankenius, the director of FITM's bachelor's degree in digital marketing. This is just another chapter in an ongoing conversation or series that we've been hosting here at the college called The Future Of. And today we are looking specifically at the future of data. We have two marvelous guests who are going to join us in a few minutes uh, and talk with us over the next hour. Diana Lavery is the senior project engineer at Esri. She is working on their living atlas of the world's policy team. And when we show you what that means in action, I think you will be as amazed as I have been digging into some of their software offerings. Our other guest is the vice president and general manager of the Books Company. The Books is an online florist and Landon Co is in charge of their data efforts. Uh, I thought it would be especially interesting to talk to him this week of all weeks as they get ready for Valentine's Day, which is when they do a very large amount of their annual business. Before we get to them, though, uh, as the director of FITM's digital marketing program, part of what I do is speak with people like Landon and Diana about the skills they want our students to have. And I used to be told in terms of analytics that they just need to understand Google Analytics and Facebook Analytics. And the truth of the matter is more recently, it's gotten much more than that. Uh, more recently, we're told our marketing students also need to be able to look at sales analytics. Uh, we're, we've been building in deeper Excel skills for our students to dig into these numbers and, and try and find meaning and interpretation for them. And they've also been learning more platforms, uh, sales platforms like, like Shopify. The biggest challenge of all, though, is not just being able to mine the data, but also to make it palatable by visualizing it in a compelling way and then crafting a story from it. And that's why we're turning to Landon and Diana today. Our focus with them will be how companies can sift through the data and find what is exactly relevant to them. And I think you'll find it sort of interesting, some of their techniques and tips that they want you to think about. But that of course will not be just the limit of what data can do. And I just wanna take a minute and kind of show you some of the things that really have caught my eye in the last year or so about how data is informing specifically our marketing efforts. So I think about dynamic retargeting. A, a company like Lexus will do this, where if you visit Lexus.com, you design a car, then as you travel across the web, you visit a new website and an ad comes up and it is the exact same car that you designed on Lexus's website that's being pushed in the ad in front of your eyeballs. We couldn't do that with a newspaper. We couldn't do that with television, but we can do it with the web and we can do it with dynamic retargeting. And Lexus has reported a multiple X increase in ROI by being able to do just that, giving you the custom color that you wanted in the car that pops up in the advertisement you look at. I also think about the Alaska Air campaign. So Alaska Airlines, we've all heard of before, Last year, they offered Californians specifically discounted flights to Hawaii. And the discount was actually based on real-time surf swells in Hawaii. So you can see as much as like a 30% discount if the surf swell was 21 foot or more. Um, pretty amazing stuff that they were doing dynamically in real time using data provided by NOAA, the National Ocean Afric and, and, and Atmospheric Administration, and, it, and then putting that into the, the website that they run. Uh, super impressive campaign just last year in 2020 from BioFreeze. It's actually continuing into 2021. Uh, take a look at this ad. As this ad runs, I'll kind of explain to you where you would see this. So let's say you went on a run and then 24 hours later, you get leg pain. Well, BioFreeze was able to partner with companies like Under Armour, some of the apps that provide and track some of our athletic activities. And from that partnership, they were able to identify 24 hours after you ran so that they could target you with an ad to soothe your muscle pains that come a day later. Uh, this particular ad led to a 25% sales increase on Amazon that they reported last year. So that's how we've been looking at it from a marketing point of view specifically. Like how can we make the most use of data to better inform our efforts? Uh, what Landon and Diana will do now is walk through a more holistic approach to it than just from the marketing point of view. Let me welcome Landon and as he gets his uh, camera turned on, as the vice president and general manager of the Books company, he leads their analytics efforts. Uh, he also teaches analytics in all honesty here in our program at FITM. Uh, we're narrowing in on Valentine's Day uh, and I 
I have to imagine it's of course one of your biggest sales days or weeks for a florist. So let's start there. Can you can you kind of walk us through how data and analytics is informing the books approach to Valentine's Day this year? Absolutely, and thanks for having me. Valentine's Day is huge for any florist. It can be 20 to 30% of revenue for the whole year. And one of the interesting things about Valentine's Day is when we look at the buyers, they skew heavily mail for this holiday and the mail buyers tend to wait until the absolute last second. So to place a Valentine's Day order, you really need to have it in by sort of the 10th or the 11th in order to get it by Sunday, especially if you're getting it, um, getting it delivered versus picking it up from a florist. So we'll see almost all of that revenue come in the next couple of days. So it's a very hectic time for our team. We've got a great analytics team that's working behind the scenes. Um, I've actually got on my other screen, I'm watching the real time order volume just to make sure nothing's going crazy um, that we're staying on track. But there's a ton of data that goes into that. And being set up for a, for a holiday with such a short um, such a short window to achieve so much revenue, it requires a lot of data points, a lot of forecasting, reforecasting, real-time reporting so that we can adjust our inventory levels and our pricing, um, work with our carrier partners like FedEx to make sure that we've got the right capacity for the amount of orders that we're going to deliver and being able to get all the stakeholders um, the right information so they can make choices if they need to cut or try to buy more inventory. And with um, COVID layered on top of it, it's just another challenge because we see a lot of shifts in buying behavior uh, mm. that aren't that weren't typical for the last seven or eight years. If I can stay on this for a second, it's sort of fascinating to think about like the Valentine's orders. So you're talking about a grower, a grower has to know in advance. So how, like how far back are you looking to this, what you call like 30% of your sales for the year potentially are coming in this weekend. So how far back do you have to actually start thinking and looking at it so that the grower knows what to grow and have enough plus have the space on the FedEx plane plus then have the delivery drivers in place. Like it's crazy to think about all the different variables in your supply chain. Sure. A lot of our part is starts with sort of uh, how much of the growers crop are we going to take? So they're looking at a macro forecast of all, all the different buyers, how much are they going to take off the farm? And then for us, we start looking at, okay, of that percentage that we're going to take, and we're looking at this six or seven months ago, how much capacity do we need to book with FedEx and which locations throughout the United States? Where do we need to have that delivered? How's it gonna come in? Um, and then we're looking at how do we wanna deploy our marketing dollars? So marketing is a huge piece of it, making sure there's the right awareness and the right performance marketing at the time when somebody's ready to buy. And, and all of those campaigns are planned out um, at least six months in advance. And then they get tweaked as we move forward. Uh, every month we're looking at that and saying, okay, we need to make these adjustments based on the way things are shifting based on the way our awareness is shifting, based on the way our performance marketing is um, performing, uh, what changes should we make? So it's a it's a big sort of a half a year effort. It's a, well, which is like for all retail, right? Like if, you, if their primary shopping season would be Christmas, they're also looking in, in like, you know, May, June. In fact, I think July this year, we're doing a panel just like this on the holiday season for 2021. So it's, uh, it seems apropos that you would be six months out. That's, that seems right. The other big area that I wanted to talk to you about is weddings. Um, I understand the Books is sort of entering this space. I'm sure you've been in it for a while, but specifically like starting to target potential brides and grooms um, with some of the work that you guys are doing. So I wonder if you can walk us through how you're using data as you sort of launch this brand new segment of your business. Absolutely. Um, weddings is a huge focus area for me right now, and it's where I spend most of my time. There are over 2 million weddings each year in the United States, and we feel that's a really good opportunity for us to expand our eco-friendly farm-to-table floral model and uh, reduce waste in the floral industry while also bringing lower prices to customers. So where we start with that is really with the business case. That's how we decide to get into it and invest in it. And we are looking at basically what is the market? What's the makeup of that market? Uh, doing deep dives into 
how much do people spend on flowers in different quartiles of the market? Uh, flowers can range anywhere from a couple hundred dollars for a wedding up into the tens of thousands, depending on the size of the wedding. So we look at where do we fit into that market? How, how does a farm to table market fit, um, you know, fit with the consumer? And then we look at the products that we can offer, uh, who are the competitors that are out there, and how do we ultimately find those couples at the time that's just right for that wedding. So a wedding consumer journey might be 12 to 15 months. A couple gets engaged and they're gonna spend, maybe they spend 12 to 15 months planning and executing that wedding. With wedding flowers, we don't wanna be at the beginning of that journey. And so when we think about the journey and map it out, we said, well, we don't need to be there right when they get engaged. That's probably too early. They've got to figure out what's the venue, what's the color scheme, how many people are in the bridal party. So maybe we're several months out and then we've got to figure out if we're not there at the time that they're getting engaged, when do we need to be there? How do we surface ourselves in that journey? So there's a ton of behind the scenes analytics that goes into identifying consumers at the point that they're getting engaged and then timing performance marketing to reach them right about the time when they're ready to buy those flowers or start entering into a discussion with a florist. We obviously don't wanna to be too late either. If they've already made their decision, uh, we've missed our window. So we spend a lot of time looking at couples and their buying behavior of flowers. It's, it's sort of interesting. It makes me wonder too, like, I, I would imagine there are easy ways to know somebody's gotten engaged, but what what are you using as a metric? Like, is it as simple as when they change their Facebook status, or are you looking at search words on Google, or what is it that tells you, oh, this consumer just got engaged? It's certainly all of the above, and I'm sure that everyone here is is aware. You're at a data and analytics panel. You're probably aware that everything that you do online is tracked and available somewhere for someone to use. So we take that data that's <clears throat> available to us and we look at things like you're talking about. So we'll look at social status. Um, when did they update that status? What part of the country are they in really can play a factor too. So different parts of the country might have a longer engagement cycle. Um, the size of the wedding can have a, uh, make a difference. So in COVID, we've actually seen larger weddings um, be, long, be further out. So we've added months to the life cycle for couples that got engaged during, during COVID that plan a larger wedding. For smaller weddings, the timeline's accelerated. These could be people reaching out to us saying, my wedding is next weekend, I need flowers. So we've got to serve all of those different markets and kind of identify them all at different points. It's, it's so dynamic, I think, which is my big takeaway always from data is data has got to be dynamic. It's not static. It changes based on COVID. It changes based on consumer and part of country. But then that makes me wonder how much is too much data. So is there a point where you're just like, OK, we have enough, like we need to stop collecting it in a period in an, in an era where we're seemingly not stopping collecting it? Sure. It's I think we've seen exponential growth in data. And we'll continue to see that. It, as we add devices to the internet and more people become connected to the internet, more traffic moves to mobile where you can shop all the time, that, that data is gonna continue to expand. And for an analytics team that's looking at demographic data, site purchasing uh, behavior, performance marketing data, customer journey data, how long it takes the customer to move through that journey, those data points will continue to expand. And I think what's really important is um, know, know the data that you're collecting and know what's the purpose of that data and always be able to start from a point where you can refine the amount of data that you're looking at. Um, start with a problem that's related to your customer. So collect everything that you can that's usable um, but when you go in to actually analyze it and make a decision, start with what's important to your customer and, and try to make it manageable in that sense. Um, and avoid, uh, I think avoid starting with a, a blank slate and saying, I just want to look at my data and find a problem to solve. It's better to start the other way around and say, I've got a problem to solve. What data do I have that can help me answer that question? Wait, so you're saying it's human centered? We, we should begin with the person and not the data? 
Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, it's it's it, it's so funny because you do have these conversations with people that they seem to think that it's all about numbers and trying to make the computer work for you. And it's really about the consumer. And as long as we keep it human centered, I think that's what's so important. Speaking of, so I collect data when people sign up for this particular webinar series. And so we've been able to track who's attended. You know, we ask as anybody who signed up for this today knows there's a bunch of people, there's a bunch of questions you answer. And it tells us, you know, if you're an entrepreneur, if you own your own business, or if you're looking to start a business. And so I know a lot of our audience is in that field, right? Wanting startups or entrepreneurship. If, if they were just starting something, uh, or even if you've been in business for a while and haven't really begun to dig into data, what would you tell them to start with? Where's the starting point? I, I think it's starting with the customer. It is human centered. I think you have to start with your customer and understand if you want to start a business or grow a small business, how does your product solve a need for that customer? What are the customer's problems in your space? What, uh, what did the existing product sets not solve for your customer and what niche are you filling? Um, once you know that you can start, um, start to build a great product or service. And that's really critical. If you can't build a great product or service for your customer, you probably won't be in business long enough to collect massive amounts of data um, that you can run through cool things like AI and ML to um, figure out interesting, cool problems. Um, you've got to start with building a great product for that customer. And I think that's, um, that's the most important thing. If I was already in the analytics game, so like taking it to the next level, once you've gotten through that beginning stage, what then is the most common question you get asked? How do you answer it? What, where do you think the attention goes? It's, it's almost always uh, the question people ask me is, which platform should I use for X? And X could be anything. It could be data warehousing. It could be visualization. It could be analytics. And I think that the, um, the answer there that I give is usually pretty general. It's to keep your, give yourself options, look for things that are easy to start with. Don't lock yourself into a long-term contract or something that requires a lot of upfront commitments or payments. Um, give yourself the ability to uh, test out different things, start without a huge investment, and then make sure your data doesn't get locked up into a proprietary data model. If some new tool comes along in six months and that's the perfect fit for your new business, you want to be able to take your data with you and move on to the next platform. So things like AWS and Azure, if you can find applications or solutions that run in those um, in those platforms, those are usually pretty good bets. So is that a big issue then? Is the the lack of portability? Is it is it a portability or is it an ownership issue? I guess. It can be for it's portability is what I'm talking about. So if you were to sign up for sort of, let's say a MarTech tool and you want to analyze all of your marketing data. So let's say that tool might connect all of your MarTech stack, um, your Facebook ads, your LinkedIn ads, everything you're running. And it turns it into a single schema that lets you analyze all of that data and uh, as one you want to be able to walk away with that or export it out to your Snowflake data warehouse or your, your Redshift. Um, if it's locked up into a model where you can't export it or you can't export it easily out into a schema that's usable, you're sort of stuck on that platform without a huge investment in, in kind of translating that data or recapturing it. So we make sure that any, uh, just in general at Books, we make sure any platform that we work with has a uh, migration capability out to um, Snowflake or AWS. So I'm hearing you say, think about your customer and the product fit. I'm hearing you say, think about, I guess maybe it's be thoughtful about the way you collect data, store data and translate the data. But I've also heard you say to your students that they should take a lo-fi approach and you may have partly addressed this already, but I'm wondering if you can explain for all of us what you mean when you say, take a lo-fi approach. Yeah, it's a weird thing for someone in analytics to say is, uh, but I, I usually say like, start outside the data, put yourself in the customer's shoes and, and walk their journey. Um, I think it's so important to building a great product or service to start with the customer that if, if you're going out to look at something, look at your business, just start with where the customer starts. How do they find out about you? Why do they need your product? 
uh, go search for those types of search terms in Google and see what comes up. Then go through your site and shop it. Ask your friends to shop it. Ask um, vendors in your space that might supply your competitors or ask people that are selling your products. If you're in retail stores, go talk to a retail store sales consultant and ask them, how would my products sell here? Um, these are the type of people that I think might buy it. They'll tell you, they talk to hundreds, if not thousands of customers a month. They'll have a pretty good insight into how, how you could go about making a great product. Um, the other part is just ask your friends, like that's, that's free. Uh, it doesn't cost anything. You don't need any tools to go talk to people and ask them for their feedback. Once they give you problems uh, or the issues that they see with your product or service, if you're already selling, then you can go in and you can start to gather the data that you need to answer that question or understand, is that a problem that I have at scale? Is that a problem that I can solve? Is it a problem that actually costs me money? Uh, would the solution help me make more money? Uh, that way, you're not starting at a point of, I'm just looking at a mass mountain of data and trying to figure out, is there a problem in here? It's, it's a much faster um, customer centric approach. And I think it will, you'll find that it drives a lot more value than just looking for problems in your data. That reminds me so much of the story of Airbnb, which was very much the same where they had these big issues. They couldn't get traction for the company. And so they got together, I think it was like a, a group of five to talk about the, the website. And literally it was friends of the founders and they, they, from that conversation, made some tweaks to the website and in one week had a 2x increase. And they're like, oh, wait, all we have to do is talk to customers and we can figure out how to make improvements to our site. And of course, they did this over the course of, I think it was three or four months. Um, and it ends up obviously growing into the Airbnb we know now. So um, obviously, Landon knows quite a bit. If you have questions for Landon, uh, you, you've probably been on a Q&A panel before. There's a Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. Feel free to click that. He will come back with us in about 15 minutes or so um, to chat some more. For now, though, thank you, Landon. That was Thanks, uh, always so great. Um, next, though, I do want to welcome Diana Lavery, who describes herself as a true social science quantoid. I yeah. hope I said that right, because that was a <laughs> yeah. new word for me. Um, she is a senior product engineer at Arcus Living Atlas of the World's Policy Map Teams. Um, Diana, let's first talk about Esri and what it is that you do there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Esri is a location intelligence software company. Um, I tell people that I work with maps all day and some people say, wait, really? People still use maps? <laughs> and I say, no, no, no. <laughs> it's maps that answer a very specific question. And it's maps that layer all kinds of things together in ways that really weren't possible 15, 20 years ago. Um, if you are old enough to remember overhead transparencies back in school, imagine you've got you know, store data here and supply data here and customer data here, and then you can bring in all kinds of other spatially um, bounded data like weather. I mean, that has a huge effect on what people buy when they buy it. Um, if they're going to go to Disneyland that day or not, talking about pre-COVID times, but, um, you know, there are so many um, data points that have some kind of location attached to them. Just think of point of sales data in the first place. And then um, what is even around your store? What, how walkable is it? How drivable is it? Um, here, I can share my screen at the moment. Um, so here is a five mile radius around, oh no, uh, am I sharing? Yes. There it is. Maybe. Yeah. yeah, okay, sorry about that. This is what people used to do. Don't do this anymore. You just point a pin in it and draw a circle around it. People want drive time polygons and then they want them you know, to specify what are the weight requirements for my trucks? Um, you know, is this going to be, um, are, are people able to parallel park by my store? What's the, that situation like? Um, so I did a walk time polygon from FITM because I know walk, it's way more walkable where you guys are. Um, so this is what a 15 minute walk time looks like, kind of close to the circle, but you do get a little bit more nuance there with, with the geographically based type of situation. 
Now I can pair that with weather data that's updated all the time. So here, maybe one of these, no, this one, sorry about that. Um, this tells us from the National Weather Service, what are the weather concerns right now? It doesn't look like there's anything in LA, thank goodness. But here in Texas, we see, hey, there's a red flag warning that's effective right now. Here are the areas affected. And this was just updated this morning. Mm. So bringing in all kinds of data like that um, is really what people are doing in terms of location intelligence, smart maps that answer a question. Um, the maps that, you know, you used to see in your your elementary school classroom that have one state one color and one state the next color that's just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to maps and location analytics and i think it speaks to and one of the reasons i was excited to have you join us today is it really speaks to the concept of well there's two things there number one data visualization is everything you've got to be able to tell the story of the data in a way that people can comprehend it um, and clearly you guys have answered for that as it relates to, to mapping. Um, the other piece though, is that, you know, Landon speaks to internal data at a company, you know, what we might call primary research, right? You speak to more that secondary research. What you're saying is there's publicly available data sets, um, like you were just showing, updated in real time with the weather that can inform us and, and help us be more creative of the data that we're using. Is, is that sort of what you think is your specialty? Yes, absolutely. Um, I love public data. I'm a big census data nerd. There's so much that people don't realize is publicly available. Um, a lot of Medicare claims data, if you're selling, you know, diabetes products or something of that nature, um, there's a federal agency that probably has a data set that would be of interest to you. And like I said, it's it's got some kind of location attached to it, whether you think it does or not. Um, anything like a zip code or um, a hospital location, that that can be mapped and that can be integrated along with all kinds of other data itself. Well, let's talk about that other kinds of data for a second, because I, you think about, you know, and we may need to explain sort of what an API is for anybody who's not familiar because there's probably not a lot of tech people out there. Um, but you could use an API for something like, I, I don't know, Netflix, right? Like kind of explain how that would work. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so API is application programming interface. And the best analogy I've heard of an API is like a vending machine. There's the snacks behind it. You are here, but you need to interface. You can't just reach in and grab the snacks. So that keypad works as your API. Well, here we are doing it with um, the web is our API. So data is really just a URL away sometimes in the form of an API. And Netflix, lots of companies, Netflix has a good API in terms of um, streaming and viewing habits that you can do analytics on. Um, other companies do too. The federal data sets that I use also have an API, so I can really easily bring in um, unemployment data from Bureau of Labor Statistics that's updated monthly alongside maybe um, weather data from National Weather Service, this, that. There, there's no, um, I came from a government agency where we were all focused on our data warehouse. And now it's been so freeing that it's like, oh no, I can grab this data here and that data here and I don't need to have it housed. It's just, it's all web-based. And I really do think that's the way it's going. One of the things we, we talked quite a bit about in this series is this whole move toward personalization. I mean, you wanna talk about what I think the future is. The future is personalization. Um, and, and it's obviously we can do it with big data in e-commerce. Amazon's the perfect example. You think about a homepage, your homepage would be different than my homepage. It depends on our viewing habits. It depends on, you know, if Amazon advertising has also been tracking what I've been doing on other websites, which is their way to get around the cookie. Like, 
we yeah. know there's there's a bunch of things coming in that way as well. But I also think about in terms of the stores, I was talking to somebody who is, runs our merchandising and marketing program here at the college. And she was saying as a, as a merchant, you have to think about the, the space where your store is and the community that you service. So a Macy's in downtown LA and a Macy's even in Sherman Oaks, you know, 30 miles, even less, 20 miles away has two very different audiences. Is that, do you think a good use for a retailer, uh, a use case, or are there different and others you could tell us about? Yes, absolutely. Um, store merchandising is a big one. Um, I know one of our customer success stories that we like to talk about is um, Fruit of the Loom. Now, you may not know that they own a whole bunch of brands, uh, Russell Athletics, they sell basketballs, you know, they have um, Vanity Fair lingerie and intimates and there's a whole bunch of things underneath fruit of the loom but in terms of what products should go to what store they are absolutely using um, the customer demographics and psychographics in those kinds of drive times and walk times from their stores like i i mentioned earlier and there's so much that can be mapped that people don't realize can be mapped like all kinds of psychographics are you likely to buy american um, are you likely to think that recycling is important? Are you likely to buy organic goods? All that, those psychographics can really be mapped um, in terms of spending absolutely can be mapped. In fact, I have another fun map to share um, if I can do it more smoothly with this time. Um, this shows beer versus wine, who spends more on beer and who spends more on wine. Um, and we see like ski resorts popping, we see the Bay Area popping for wine and the, the East Coast. And then beer is this dark gray, or excuse me, the bright um, grayish brown here. So things like that can really tell you. So um, if I've got one store in one location, and another store and another, even if it's something as basic as a grocery store, this can really, uh, you know, the spending patterns behind your customers are absolutely mappable, absolutely uh, being used to stock those stores. And while you've got that open, so can you, like how granular does that get then? Like, okay, so we see Southern California's on the pinker end, but mm -hmm. can you get into neighborhoods in Los Angeles? Yeah, so this one is a map presented at counties, um, but yes, you can um, absolutely drill down and you can even um, do this, this uh, walk time. Okay. You can see just in that walk time who spends more on, on beer and wine if I wanted to do it here for us. Um, but yeah, it can get extremely granular. So, the, which, okay, then the next question is pretty obvious. If it can get that granular, how do you get into it but not get overwhelmed by it? Exactly. That is a very good question. Um, one of the biggest skills for any data analyst, I would say, is learn how to subset your data. <laughs> because there's, there's almost too, I mean, there really is too much data. And so being able to say, no, I'm only going to focus on maybe this particular product or this particular area, this particular part of um, the ecosystem that I'm involved in, I think has been extremely helpful for me. One of the biggest ways I subset, <laughs> one of the biggest ways I subset data is with time. Um, I'm not interested in anything that happened over a year ago, maybe, mm. or over six months ago, whatever the case may be, depending on my exact question at the moment. Um, but yeah, yeah. Time. I mean, and it goes back to what we were talking about with Landon and that, that you know, that everything's changing and it's so dynamic. So that's probably a very smart tip. Um, when you think about where this is all headed, where do you see the future of data going? I see more and more being available web-based. Um, like I mentioned with those APIs before, I think a lot more organizations are going that route, um, particularly for bringing in that external data. Obviously their internal stuff, they need to have um, more 
close to their chest. But in terms of incorporating external data, it's going to become easier and easier. And so being able to to integrate it all together is where I get to play every day and I love it. Um, let's invite Landon to rejoin us. And, and as he gets his camera back on, I, I kind of like to start with him in the same spot. Where do you see the future of data going? What's, what's your prediction? Yeah, I, I think the amount of data will continue to grow and the ways that we use it will continue to evolve. I think there are a lot of opportunities, especially um, to apply machine learning in different ways to simplify life for customers. I think it starts from uh, the top sort of what we talked about. It starts at a very macro view. What's the problem that you can solve for a customer? There's so many things you could do with data. Um, it's figuring out what's valuable to a customer. How can you implement it? Uh, what's realistic? You know, what's feasible with the amount of money and technology that's available this time? I think our lives will get so much easier and some and things will get simplified for us by um, by the growth of data and machine learning technology. Mm. We, um, we've gotten a few comments. And again, just a reminder to our audience that you're welcome to type in in the Q&A at the bottom. Uh, but I, I actually have a few questions that we didn't get into before. So I'm going to throw them at you while we wait for a couple people to, to, to come at this. Um, privacy is becoming, uh, I think we're finally having a legitimate conversation about it. You look at what's going on in Europe, um, even some of the moves in Australia, I think they're starting to take stronger lead on privacy that I think will trickle down internationally, including to the States. Um, you look at what Apple's doing uh, and having people to opt in instead of opt out of collecting your data. And there's a big battle between Apple and Facebook right now about that. Uh, you look at the removal of cookies from Google, and I know we're seeing some, some things happening that uh, potentially could replace the cookie, but that's, that for, if you don't know, that's the piece of data that's tracking you that allows for that retargeted ad as you leave the Lexus website. So I'm wondering if that plays a, a part as you guys think about data and these larger sets of data, does that play a part in what you're thinking about and as you look toward the future? Or are you just like, no, 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 we're still going to have plenty of data. I don't need what you've, I don't need it so granular to know that it's Tom versus it's Land, and I just need to know that they're both males in their, you know, early 40s. Yeah, um, privacy, especially geographically based data, it becomes a real issue because geography is one of the easiest ways to identify someone. Um, so with a lot of medical data, for example, I know they'll add a little bit of noise to it. So like, um, me as someone who might be um, thinking of having an, a baby soon, um, that'll be kind of shuffled in with everyone else. And so you won't be able to drill down exactly to me, but you can definitely drill down to my zip code, my block group, et cetera. And it holds up pretty well. Mm. Landon, um, okay. oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Diane. Yeah. Yeah, it's like when you want the cross cuts of like age and sex and race and geography, sometimes you do have to make trade-offs. So maybe I can't get block group, but I'm okay with maybe census tract or something like that um, to get like age and race or uh, age and sex or uh, who knows. But yeah, there are definitely some, some trade-offs that we face, but uh, adding a little tiny bit of noise to the geographic points Mm. is an approach that I've seen a lot of times. Landon, what are you seeing in terms of privacy? I think there are two pieces to it. Um, def certainly starting with privacy is important and you have to treat customers' data that, the way that they want it to be treated and used. I think there's a lot of value for consumers in getting personalized ads and personalized recommendations. Um, while it is using your data, it's going to make your purchasing decisions easier. It's gonna help you find the thing that, you're, uh, that you need most or that will best fits you as a person. So I think there's a trade-off there for consumers to think about it's not, um, it may not be that bad to have, um, to share your data with companies. The other piece is this is relatively new. You know, the personalization, 
this has not been around for that long. And I would say I spent the first like 10 years of my career at AT AT&T and TV and entertainment. When you're looking at TV, um, TV shows, movies, ads, this type of data isn't available except for on sort of digital platforms now. So people have been really successful in the past working with much less data. So I think even if we scale it back, uh, we anonymize some of the data, there's still a lot that we can do that wasn't available in traditional models. And there's still a ton of innovation that can happen um, even with a little less data than we have today. Hmm. Uh, A couple questions coming in. Uh, One here, how affordable is data for a new company or brand? It seems like there are a lot of options, but do each just add more cost? I think the end question is, how do you evaluate the ROI on that? Sure. So I think it it depends on the type of data. So there's data that's available from third party providers. If you want to go out and enhance customer profiles, it's relatively cheap to go buy demographic data on every person in your database. You could probably go append a list of however many customers have shopped your site for in the range of a dollar to $2 per customer and learn everything about them, um, where they shop, what their affinities are, um, gender, age, marital status, number of cars that they own. It's all, it's all out there for sale. If you use the internet, it's out there. Um, if it's talking about the platforms, if we're thinking about how much does it cost to get set up on platforms, if you're using something like AWS or Azure, it's, it's free, basically. They all offer free tiers of data uh, mm-hmm. of, um, of their different tools. So you can get started for almost nothing. It just depends on how you use the platform. Mm. Diana, it's also, I, I, I shouldn't speak for you, but I, tell us what, what your thoughts on that then are. Yeah, I mean, I would say um, learning how to subset, you know, only seeing what you really do want to be working with is going to help you. And then um, a lot of geographic data is is not all that proprietary. I mean, if elevation is important to you, um, that is something that is known by everyone, you know? Um, Stuff like um, the weather service and the census demographics, stuff like that. Um, again, it's it's publicly available. What Esri does is we've made it integrated into um, our software, but you can absolutely go to um, National Weather Service or census.gov or Bureau of Labor Statistics and do it kind of yourself um, because that's, I, I, I hate to say this, but that's our, our tax money, you know, it goes into producing that data. And so um, it's that kind of data is is free in a lot of ways. Um, Dan, I love this question for you. What's an interesting data point you can share that seemed counterintuitive? Mm. Counterintuitive. Yeah, so I know there's all kinds of, um, concern with like air quality has it gone up or down with COVID a lot of people are commuting less um it it's generally gone down but it's gone up in very specific places um so how to address like the groceries the Costco parking lot um things like that and, and who works there, who's there for eight to 10 hours every day, um, and who is affected by that increase in air quality when air quality has gone down over the years, and particularly now with COVID with so many people not commuting. Um, yeah, things like that. Definitely. Um, Landon, this one may be more for you. How predictable are we as humans and consumers? What are the limits to targeting consumers based on search um, or first purchase? So the example, this that's Mona, who I know, thank you, Mona, for the question. She says, I searched for a baby monitor, but we're not expecting or have a newborn. Um, so would the data then tell you that she's expecting a newborn? Or is it able to cross-reference um, and find out that she's not expecting a newborn? I, I think depending on the 
a, amount of data that's available to you. Let's say uh, Mona searched on target.com and they could pair that with all of the other products that she's searched for then they could probably build a pretty good profile of who Mona is and, and the demographics, uh, the likelihood that she is expecting a child or perhaps looking for it as a, you know, maybe it's a baby shower gift or something like that. So how, how predictable are we? I think it comes down to the amount of data that you have and what you're trying to predict. Uh, if, if we're saying that we want to predict how often is Tom going to buy a case of paper towels, we can probably get pretty, we can probably get pretty close on that. Um, if we're going to predict something, uh, you know, something like a, a less rational purchase, how often are you going to, I, I don't know, take a, take a flyer and head off to Vegas just a, on a whim. I, I think those things are a little bit harder to predict things that happen less frequently, obviously have less data points. Um, to predict. So I think it just depends on what you're trying to predict and how much volume of uh, the volume of data you have around uh, the prediction. So we're not to minority report just yet. <laughs> no, I don't think no. so. Okay. Okay. Just wanted to make sure. Just wanted to make sure. It is interesting you brought up the paper towels because it's funny. In the last year, we've really been much more aware in our house of our waste. And that is one of the things that we've cut back on is we, we bought cloths and are no longer buying as many paper towels at a time when the rest of the universe is buying paper towels, which I guess this goes back to that question of dynamic data. And, and Diana, to your point, the idea of like limiting, you know, or using the subsets, but it, would you be able to know like, oh, Tom skipped the last three times he was supposed to buy paper towels. So something's going on in his household. Are you, can you get, can you get there on me yet? Let's see either one of you. I don't know. Do you have an answer on that? I don't think you. I don't think you could. But you could know that Tom isn't buying paper towels from me anymore. You could be buying your paper towels somewhere else, and there is someone that knows that you're doing that, and it's your ISP. Uh, you know, probably if you could be blended across mobile and broadband data, you could know that if you're the internet service provider. But there, there are a lot of rules and regulations around using that data. So rest assured, uh, you know, the telcos of the world aren't looking at your data to figure out if you're not buying paper towels anymore. <laughs> they know. They know. They're watching. Uh, this interesting question comes in. So exciting to be here. Top fashion designer, fascinated about marketing data. However, question is when I did Google ads recently on natural fabric leggings that are not gym sets, I saw the search that led to clicking on my ads were toddler leggings or leggings that are for gym or running, which did not make sense. So I guess that goes back to that sort of idea of counterintuitive thinking. Is, is there a lot of counterintuitive thinking that goes into this that, that maybe isn't complete or the idea isn't, doesn't make sense to us? Oh, go for it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Diana, go for it. There you okay. go. Okay. Okay. Um, I, yeah, I'm, I'm sure there is. Um, I, I too get that kind of non sequitur ad stream that comes to me. And it's like, oh, maybe they were going for something else that I searched for as a gift or, yeah, I've seen a lot of that just personally. Um, I think too, what, um, what I have to remind myself is that I always remember the one ad that kind of got it wrong and I take for granted the dozens that I just saw that morning that got it really right. Hmm. Um, like what you mentioned about paper towels, I am always amazed as to how they know when I need diapers again for my kid. It just It's like clockwork. They know somehow. Um, and so, I think, yeah, we're, we're getting to this personalization phase and some are more advanced than others, but there are a lot out there that I've been surprised that they get it very, very head on. Hmm. Landon, any, any thoughts? Landon, we lost your sound. 
Oh, can you hear me now? No, we got you. Yes. All right. I would just add to the Google ads question that if you're just starting that campaign and starting to run it, it will take some time to get volume. So Google's running a very sophisticated uh, machine learning algorithm behind the scenes to figure out who are the customers that are likely to click through and buy from you. So if you've enabled enhanced e-commerce tracking on your site, so Google can know that ad actually led to a sale or a conversion, over time, the recommendations for those ads will get better and better, but they are, they're impacted by whatever inputs you put in about, um, you know, your budget, how much, how do you want to target the campaign? Who do you want to target? Anything you add to that campaign will, will influence it. But over time, um, the, the um, Google ads algorithm will refine the customers that it's targeting and optimize for whatever you set it to optimize for. And if that's conversions, it's going to learn wherever they're coming from, whatever they were looking at, it's going to look for the people that are likely to buy. And another, another question comes in for you. How much is too much targeting, too many ads pushed through to customers to a point of annoyance? You search once for something and some companies think you will want the same item to appear on your search and devices and all over the place. Um, what, what are you guys seeing? Where, what's the limit? Sure. So we, um, we try to limit like, we, so we set frequency capping is what that is. So you want to, you want to have frequencies that's going to depend on your customer. I think from a finance perspective, it's whatever the break even point is on your, on your CPM and the amount of customers that you're going to lose from that are either unsubscribing or get annoyed by your ads. So being able to measure what's the churn away from my brand in terms of brand affinity uh, versus the additional conversions that I'm going to drive for every, you know, if I increase the number of ads that you see from 10 to 20, uh, am I going to lose a customer uh, but gain two more sales um, from other customers that I'm marketing to? So I think it really depends on the product and the customer. I think Mona would also find this question interesting, Landon, that I'll direct at you and Diana, if you have anything to add after. But uh, when you think about the advertising funnel from awareness through purchase, Landon, in your experience, how many brands are focusing on the full funnel? Is that common? I would say at larger companies, it's it's very common, and you'll have you have something like a media mix model that looks at all channels, offline and online uh, digital channels. I think with with newer companies, uh, especially startups that aren't going to invest heavily, they may not invest heavily in TV ads or radio ads that are harder to measure. Mm -hmm. You'll see a lot of focus on performance marketing and last touch, uh, last touch in the funnel. How did my search app perform? How did my social campaign perform? It's really important when you, when you have the scale and the volume and you're running TV ads to be able to look full funnel and think about how am I driving awareness? How do I move this customer through the journey? And uh, it's, it's just really important, the customer journey and understanding how those customers move um, through their life cycle with you as a company. But it's not for everyone. Media mix modeling is very expensive. Multi-touch attribution modeling is, uh, there are a lot of assumptions that go into it and you're gonna need an expert team to help you model that and understand it. Diana, any, anything to add on that? Any thoughts? Uh, no, no, he summed it up pretty well, I think. I guess just with the last few minutes that we have in, in your final thoughts on the whole subject matter is, and we've, we've touched on this a little bit, but Diana would maybe start with you is if you're thinking about a company that you work for, you, I mean, there's so many terms, there's so much to think about, there's so much data. Where's the, what, what, where's the diving in point, do you think, for just the average person working in retail? Yeah, um, I think it was brought up earlier, understanding your customer first, and then um, how can we serve them better? And from there, that can spur a whole bunch of questions that then can be answered and hypothesis that can be test, tested and what have you. But um, I think it really does come down to like, what makes someone buy my product or my service? Because all the analytics in the world is not gonna help a, a bad product or a bad service. So um, I think really it, it comes down to 
you know. Yeah. 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 And how about you, Landon? Any any last thoughts? I, this is kind of like Diane is proving your point or underlining your point. Um, <laughs> any last thoughts on that and, and how to really think about that customer? Where, where do you, you know, if you don't even think about how to begin that process, where would you begin that? I, I would start with the people that are the least satisfied. So a really interesting study that we ran at at and we were trying to understand should we focus on people that are promoters, people that are detractors, or people that are neutral from a net promoter score perspective? Mm -hmm. And for people that aren't familiar, so in the net promoter score, you're a promoter if you're a 10 or a nine um, on a one to 10 scale, you're a detractor if you're a one through a six and you're neutral if you're a seven or an eight. And we're trying to figure out how do we improve um, our profitability or revenue by focusing on one of these groups specifically. The intuition was that we might wanna make more neutral people promoters. So move them up into that really satis um, satisfied range. What we found when we looked at it was, it was two times more valuable to move somebody that was dissatisfied or a detractor up into a neutral category than it was to move someone from neutral to promoter. Mm -hmm. And we found there was almost no change if we made someone go from a nine or a 10, nine to a 10 in the promoter score was, it didn't move the needle much. So I would say, start with the people that are the least satisfied, the people that are complaining about your product, they have word of mouth impacts on your business. Um, they're going to churn faster and they're just a subset of the customers. So they're, they're really, um, I, I would go focus on that group and fix their problems, understand what they don't like. And that will magnify itself and it will pay benefits across all of your, uh, across your entire customer base. Talk about counterintuitive. That's, that's excellent. Thank you. Thank you both um, for the last hour and for sharing so much information with us. Cause I think this is, uh, it is one of the drier topics, but I think the two of you brought some life to it um, and made sense that, you know, kind of made the point of how important this is as we look toward the future of our industries. So thank you both. Um, next month, we meet again to discuss the future of fast fashion. This actually picks up where our conversation last month on zero waste left off and actually includes a fascinating startup in the data space and how data is helping to inform the future of fast fashion. So there's a lot to talk about there. I know that's been a, a big topic in the fashion and retail industries of late. So join us next month when we talk about that. Uh, in the next day, you'll receive a link uh, to a recording of today's webinar. There will also be a link in there to RSVP to next month's webinar on the future of fast fashion. Um, so until we meet again next month, we encourage you to stay inspired and have a great afternoon.